Well, I appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Hopefully uh, the presentation you find informative and helpful in shaping Norfolk Town Center. Uh, my name is Richard McCarthy. I'm the town planner. Uh, we have tonight two gentlemen from MAPC, our Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, we're going to have a presentation um, talking about things about Norfolk Center we'd like to see happen over time and how we make those things happen. There's been a lot of work over the years to try to develop a nice New England village town center and we want to continue that pathway and we'll talk about that as well. And uh, we will have actually uh, some interactive questioning that you can participate as we go through the presentation to do some voting. So, and that'll be through uh, use of cell phones. So hopefully everybody has a cell phone. If not, um, won't be able to vote on that, but hopefully you do. I'll turn it over to Josh Viala from MAPC and then he'll uh, introduce Joe and then we'll get started. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Fiala. I'm a principal planner with the MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. It's the regional planning agency for Norfolk and all the communities that surround you. So 101 other communities, but within the 495 belt. I'm here with my colleague, Joe Saki, who's also in the land use department. Uh, and Joe's helping me out with this process and, and uh, looking at Norfolk Center. And this evening, uh, we're gonna walk through why we're studying the town center, uh, what is the focus of the study, uh, how you would like the study to proceed and what you think about it, uh, and also uh, the next steps in the study. So kind of laying everything out, uh, we're looking at uh, bringing forward recommendations, which we'll describe in detail what those are uh, in a pretty quick time frame, looking uh, to bring forward recommendations to you uh, in June or so. So this is moving right along. We're here in April tonight. And this is the uh, regional area of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. If you're not familiar with us, we're a state agency, a regional agency uh, that provides technical assistance services to communities like Norfolk, um, providing planning, municipal collaboration, procurement, uh, transportation, all sorts of uh, help for uh, municipalities that need help. So uh, typically we're invited into communities. In this case, we were invited uh, through Rich's office and the planning department uh, to come and help look at the town center and how uh, investment could be encouraged here. So here's the agenda I just went through. I'll pause for some questions or discussion at each of those major agenda items. And then as Rich mentioned, we do have some interactive uh, phone voting. Uh, but one thing too, if uh, Rich was saying, if you don't have a phone, you can't participate. That's not exactly true. If you don't have a phone, just use the piece of paper. Uh, and we'll collect those answers at the end of the meeting. But the phone voting is pretty cool. So hopefully a couple of you at least have a phone because uh, it shows up live on the screen, which is one of the fascinations of technology these days. Um, but first, I, I want to talk to you about the study itself and, and give you uh, an understanding of, of why we're here uh, and why we're so excited to be here. Uh, one of the reasons is that really this is a, a quintessential New England town common. Uh, in fact, as I was putting this presentation together, I googled the New England Town Common. And lo and behold, on the top row, one of the images that came, came through is actually Norfolk Center, right? I don't know if you know, so I don't know if you guys sit around googling your town or not, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty interesting that when you think about a New England Town Center or a New England Town Common, that the picturesque uh, Norfolk Center, which you all enjoy, is right up there uh, from what people all around the world are seeing if they do a Google search on the topic. Some of the other uh, really picturesque postcard beauties, Princeton, Massachusetts is also in that top row. You see, I mean, these are the, the things that New England postcards are made of, right? Paxton, Massachusetts, another beautiful uh, central common with a monument and an original meeting house. Bar, Massachusetts, and Norfolk. So you see uh, those, the similar composition of the green and the meeting house or church and the gazebo or other uh, features in that common. And that's really what we all can imagine when we think of a New England town center. Those are the elements of it. And you've got that, you've got that already, and it's beautiful. And you've also expressed uh, maybe yourselves specifically or residents or neighbors 
through previous plans what your vision for town center is. Uh, and these are taken from your town master plan. Uh, so Norfolk citizens would like its town center developed into a traditional pedestrian oriented New England village with retail, commercial services, and mixed uses, including housing that provides for social and cultural interactions for all age groups. So these are previous studies which have uh, been building up to support the reason why we're looking at it again this evening and, and through the next few months, and have been looking at it for the past few months. And even the previous studies have identified some issues uh, and specific guidance to improve the likelihood of those outcomes allowing more uses as of right, reducing special permits, uh, simplifying approvals, providing infrastructure, allowing higher density of uses, developing guidelines, et cetera. So those are all things that we're actually focused on and looking at through this process, is how to implement some of those ideas which have been identified in previous studies. And here are some of those previous studies. So I mentioned the master plan uh, more recently it was a town-wide town economic development plan, which was also performed by MAPC. Uh, the existing zoning bylaws, we're also looking at those very closely uh, to understand what some of the uh, issues with the town center zoning may be. The recent housing production plan, which identified town center as a place that could see some different housing types uh, uh, as opposed to single family houses. Uh, Norfolk open space and recreation plan and how that relates to the town common and other amenities in the, in the town center. And then I mentioned uh, the master plan as well. So all these documents are building up to why we're here and what this study is all about. But it's not just studies. Uh, we think that Norfolk is in a great position uh, relative to some of your town center peers. Uh, you've already accomplished a lot and you have a lot of assets already which make this uh, a tremendous opportunity, exciting. The commuter rail uh, is an asset which you have already. Many places don't have that. Uh, streetscape and road, roadway improvements, the roundabouts, all of those have recently uh, been completed and invested. Uh, they're beautiful uh, and help make the transportation and traffic flow in the center work better. You have development which has been completed or is recently underway. Uh, that's something that other places are trying to get started, but that's already happening here. Uh, you have a wastewater treatment district, which is huge. Uh, and that uh, we're looking into the details of that and there might be some capacity which could support additional development uh, and then you have undergrounded utilities already, which is another really big deal. So these are all major wish list items which other communities are trying to tick off one by one, uh, and you've already accomplished many of them. Uh, and so that's, that's a really a tremendous tribute to the work you've already done or been a part of. Hopefully some of you already saw that we have an online survey that's been available uh, since uh, sometime at the beginning of March. Uh, in that online survey, we have some results from this evening, some preview. It will remain open past this meeting. I think I'm going to close the survey down on April 18th, uh, was the date that looked best on my calendar to do that. Uh, so it will be going for a, l a little while longer into next week. Uh, so if anyone's watching this at home, please do participate in the online survey if you haven't already. Uh, I checked just before we came this evening, it's over 500 responses now. So I think that's, that's actually getting to be a good sample of the, the town and what those opinions look like. Uh, and we hope to just keep growing that over the next few days. So one of the main questions that relate to why we're here, uh, we had a question in the survey that asked, how satisfied are you with the town center today? And this is the results uh, as of earlier this week that show that actually 79% of respondents uh, are either only neither satisfied or dissatisfied, dissatisfied or extremely dissatisfied. So falling below that line there. So none of those are really resounding accolades for the town center in its current state. So that's another justification based upon that and all the plans which I've just recently referenced. Uh, it's a good reason and a good time to be looking at how to improve and, and, and encourage investment in town center. So I already mentioned some of the uh, main components of the town common and that picture-perfect postcard image. Uh, but I want to just go through the evolution of the town common and some of the where we're at today and how it's, how it's gotten there. And I, I love diagrams like this, so I'm happy to share them with you guys. But so it started first off right with the meeting house and the town common. And so when the populations in New England and the settlements got big enough, they would create this as one of the first fundamental pieces of the community. 
And those, uh, the community would grow up small around those at first, things like the pastor's house or the blacksmith, we're thinking those, those old, old times when settlements were first happening. And you see these major components in this diagram are very familiar to us because they're happening over and over in, in the center of many of our New England communities. So those main streets would get established and, and bring you to that center of the settlement. And then over time, those main streets would become the focus of other activity, like a town center, maybe if uh, town facilities outgrew, being uh, working in a meeting house, you might see more, uh, more town offices grow up in that same area. So that's a, a pretty common theme. And then you also see additional development and activity occur on those main streets. So things like a tavern or a general store. And this is what you see uh, in Norfolk and all over. And then the town really grew up around that. And that's one of the treasures of our region, actually. Other places in the United States haven't developed that way, and they miss that. Or maybe they don't miss it because they don't know that it's not there. But uh, coming from New England, you, you know it's not there if you go to a place like the Southwest. It's a very different type of development. And this is a very human-centered, walkable, mixed-use type of development. But what we've done over the past 50 years or so is a little bit of a disservice to this model of development. And you can see, if you didn't notice that little change on the corner of this main, I don't know if my dot's working very well, but on that main corner of the two streets, we in the you know, era from the 50s forward have definitely changed our town centers to be more car oriented and in the process have done things like you see here in this diagram, put parking in front of buildings and made it easy for a car to get to a site, but really taken away in the process some of the character of the town center. And so that's, this is a very simple diagram, but I think it gets to the heart of what this type of evolution of the town center is about and what we're actually trying to improve and repair in a place like Norfolk's town center. So it's that kind of site that we're trying to make different in terms of how future development occurs, and maybe create the environment for sites that might look like that today to improve themselves over time. Not immediately, but in the long term. So back to that checklist uh, in terms of where we're at and what Norfolk has been to accomplish, been able to accomplish. The diagram is very simple. I think to understand what needs to happen, I think is a pretty straightforward approach from a architects and urban, urban planners and urban designers perspective. Uh, but it's actually very difficult to implement. So the first uh, check box there is that the community vision has to be there and you have to have proactive planning to support that vision. I think Norfolk has that done and this process is a, is a continuation of that to see it forward. Regulations and incentives that encourage investment. That's really the focus of what we're looking at and refining. Uh, there's been iterations uh, in terms of the town center zoning. Some investment has been able to occur in the current zoning context, but we want to make sure that the right types of investment and more investment can occur uh, on properties which haven't developed yet. But then you also have to make sure that private investment uh, can happen. We're talking about private properties which are privately owned and will be privately redeveloped. It's not the town that is redeveloping these properties. So we need to make sure that any of the zoning uh, recipes that we come up with in terms of dimensions and parking requirements and all of that, we think is financially feasible. So we're looking at the financial uh, realities of what these properties have to go through. Uh, and so those are also driven by the owner's circumstances, which might be uh, tied up in such a way that development's really not possible in certain time periods. Has to also deal with the development's fit on a property and how that looks, the lending environment, uh, wastewater treatment, as I mentioned, is a big deal in places without sewer access. Uh, so these are all uh, elements which are technical in nature, but critical to whether or not a property can be a part of redevelopment and, and investment. And then lastly, if all of those hurdles are met, when a specific project comes forward, uh, it's also important to think about the community concerns about that specific project. So what's it look like? What's its scale? How much traffic is it going to generate? What's its impact on schools? And that's really oftentimes the last hurdle uh, that has to be overcome. But what we're hoping is that through these types of processes, we're setting up projects which the community will think are beneficial and will be successful, and that last hurdle won't be so onerous. So other places have made progress on all of this, and I think are good examples to look at. Uh, and a few of them are, are pretty close by. Wayland Town Center is a project uh, which Wayland has built up from a greenfield, really. Uh, they did not have a historic town center in that location, but now you can see they've actually uh, built out 
uh, a very New England looking town center where they didn't have one previously. And that's become a center of community and a center of commerce and a center of some resident, a new residential neighborhood in that town. Kingstown, Rhode Island has done a similar process where a town center did not exist there before. They needed one or felt they were lacking one. And they come up with uh, zoning and an overall master plan or planned unit development to make that happen. And you can see the, the community aspects of that project in the central column there. Oop. And then also Millis, uh, one of your neighbors here, has had progress in building mixed use projects in their town center along their main street in Route 109. Uh, and so those, uh, along with investments like you've been making in their public library, have in, reinvigorated their town center right adjacent and across from town hall. So as I said, I'll just pause here and see if uh, there are any questions that that initial preamble raised. Uh, okay, so then I will uh, continue on and maybe the next couple parts will raise a few more questions and we can... Sure. Yes, correct, yeah. So uh, the slide where I was showing the evolution of the town center, one of the slides I showed was really uh, flipping the traditional town center development pattern so that it would be more car oriented. And I think that's what, that's from our standpoint, that's what's less conducive to a happy town center character. Um, so that's where, that's the direction we're coming from. If we can discuss this evening if uh, that coincides with your viewpoints, I think it does. Um, so uh, let's get into a little, be little bit of the details of this study and the focus of it. Um, and I've talked around the concepts of it, but specifically sort of what our deliverables are. So at the top, top of this slide there, really, we're focused on encouraging vibrant mixed uses uh, in town center and mis mixed use development and investments. Um, and those have been occurring. This is not something that, this is uh, right adjacent to town hall, there's a project which fits perfectly with the type of thing we're trying to promote uh, and incentivize. Uh, but there are other properties, uh, greenfield properties in the town center, which are also ready for development and haven't seen development yet. So we're looking at all of the reasons why that might be occurring and going to make recommendations to the town about things that could be tweaked or changed to help those other properties also come along in that way. So what specifically does that mean? A lot of it relates to and has to do with zoning in the town center. And I'll show you exactly where that zoning is occurring. Uh, but we're looking at all the characteristics of the zoning in town center uh, to think about that likelihood of mixed use development and what may or may not be an impediment to that. Uh, that includes dimensional characteristics, parking, setbacks, heights, all of that. We're also preparing a set of design guidelines for town center and design guidelines don't exist for town center today. Um, or there are very light design guidelines in the zoning, I should say, design standards. Uh, and we're, we're putting together a more visually oriented package so that development that does come forward fits with the character that you want to see happen. Uh, and we're trying to get at those characteristics through meetings like this and through the online survey. And then lastly, we'll also be looking at things beyond the regulatory environment to understand what other impediments there may be, such as stormwater or wastewater considerations. So those, um, we will sort of be able to frame out maybe some concepts and recommendations, but we are not engineers in our office, so we'll have to just leave those at some general directions and recommendations for, for some of that. But then the town will be poised to continue on some of those recommendations with additional engineering studies potentially. Uh, our schedule, as I mentioned, we're here in April. We started um, really working earnestly on this probably in the uh, February or so time frame, doing background research and understanding the context of uh, the town center. And we will, uh, mostly because of funding constraints, so the town really isn't uh, paying that much for this study, it's through grants, through organizations like Mass Housing. And there are um, grant deadlines that we're trying to deal with, funding deadlines, so we have to complete our study by the end of June to be able to make sure that that money gets passed through appropriately from all the state agencies. Um, so that's the rush here. It's not like we're trying to hide anything. It's really just so that the townhouse doesn't have to pay for it. Um, so uh, we're, we'll, we'll be rushing along. Uh, we'll be able to do a little bit of work after June, but m the majority of 
the meat of our hours will have to be spent before June just because of those funding constraints. Um, and so from here, after this, we'll be compi compiling all the information and feedback that you give us uh, in May. We'll be thinking about all of that information and what direction to take the recommendations, adding in our own technical analyses of the zoning particularly. Uh, bring those recommendations to a working committee, which I'll show you in a minute who's a part of that committee. Uh, and then uh, refining those recommendations in May and June with that committee and with the town. So we're working with a, uh, what's called the B1 Zoning District Working Committee, and you see that membership here. Uh, but it's a good uh, collection of uh, town leadership and residents uh, across the Board of Selectmen, Board of Health, Planning Board, uh, all the different uh, entities which need to be very closely aware of what's going on in this type of work, that need to be a part of a zoning change or zoning recommendations, and will be ultimately the uh, guide in, guiding reviewers, the design review board, uh, I also should mention, uh, which will be a part of implementing those types of recommendations and seeing them through if they are adopted. Now I just want to share a few other um, survey results with you. So this is again the summary of the survey that you saw before. Uh, and I just wanted to show some of these because it's not just the committee that we're working with in terms of our engagement with the uh, town, but it really is uh, residents. And I, as I mentioned, over 500 of you now have participated in the survey. Almost all of the responses have self-identified as residents. We have no way of checking these answers, but I mean, we'll say that's what they are because that's what people say. Um, but that's a, a good representation, we hope, of uh, different uh, across section uh, in Norfolk and, uh, and getting to be a high number. So we're uh, really trusting what we're hearing from the survey as a good uh, sounding board for some of these questions. And uh, the next question was, uh, would you walk or bike from your house to town center? And I think it, uh, a higher number than I was anticipating of that 500 or so responses have said yes. So they're feeling like uh, they're under certain circumstances, and there were some comments about what those conditions would have to be, um, would, would feel like in the future they could walk or bike to town center, which I think is a good number of residents to think about to promote town center to businesses or uh, developers in the future. And also, uh, how do you feel about town center, or how often do you visit town center today? Uh, so, Many of you visit town center uh, pretty often, so more than once a week is that middle line there with 139, and then almost once per day, and then more than once per day or multiple times a day. So 87% of you are visiting uh, almost once per week, if I can read my small print there. And then uh, a small, much smaller percentage are visiting less frequently than that. So this is another great factoid to share with prospective developers or tenants about how people are using town center. Why are people visiting? Uh, you can see it's mostly the businesses that are driving that. Also the library and town center, town services are a high number there. And the commuter rail isn't the, the leading element there. It's really the, the other parts of town center that are driving visitation which I think is an important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about some of those empty sites and how they could also drive visitation better. Getting into the commuter rail there, we were also interested in how many days per week people are riding the commuter rail. There's a fair amount of uh, respond respondents that don't ride the commuter rail really at all. Uh, some that ride once or so per week, but not every week. And then as you can expect, there's a, a little bit of variation, but then another bump when you get to five days, the work week, of course. People are riding just about every day in a work week. That's the 49 you see there. And then there's a, I don't want to call any single individual out, but they're anonymous in the survey, but there's one, one probably a little overworked person who's working six, day, six days a week on the commuter rail, potentially. Um, so that's, a, but most, mostly people are using the commuter rail a little less frequently than you might think. Uh, and also, uh, with the commuter rail comes a lot of parking, about 500 parking spaces in town center, over 500 that are there available for it. So we were wondering if there was a, a parking difficulty in the town center in terms of people's experience. And over 87% of you said that you do not have an issue uh, when you park, either no, not ever, 
or no, uh, not often. Uh, whereas a few of you uh, seem to have issues sometimes or almost every time, a small percentage. And also from the, com the uh, survey was set up so that we could zero in on some of the locations that people are having difficulties in, which I don't have that information with me tonight, but we'll be looking at that back at the office. So we have some specific comments about where those parking issues are occurring. Yeah, the, the question was about correlating some of those answers to see if there's a pattern there between if you're a commuter rail user and having parking issues. And yes, we can actually, the responses are anonymous, but we can see the same answers from the same respondent. So we can tell if we can cross-reference commuter rail riders with parking issues, for example. So we can dig into that data and make some draw some conclusions from it. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, the question was, um, should we focus the survey more so maybe on commuter rail passengers also to see if they, they're having issues, to see what their responses would be if they're not Norfolk residents? Um, I do think the survey responses, well, clearly what we've seen in the indications is that it's Norfolk residents which are responding to the survey. We haven't put the survey up at the commuter rail station itself, which would be something we could do if we're interested in that. Um, the, I do believe there is a fair amount of non-Norfolk resident commuter rail riders which are also using the parking lots, uh, the commuter rail lots, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, but I, we might be able to get a percentage of that from the MBTA. They do occasionally study uh, license plates that park in the lots and might have a feel for the in-town versus out-of-town residents. So, uh, oh, sure. The, the question, just for our audience at home, I'll re I'm, that's why I'm repeating things, uh, is that the, uh, if there were sidewalks on certain roads, then the number of people who wouldn't walk or bike would probably be less because they would be more willing to. And that actually showed up in the comments that I've seen where people, we gave them the option to say, if you won't walk or bike, why? And most people would say, a specific road, and well, if it had a bike lane or a sidewalk, then I would, I would do that. So we have some very specific locations where sidewalks would be beneficial. It's a good point. So I, I talked about the geography of the study, and here's a diagram to make that uh, very clear. Uh, so we are looking at zoning as our uh, foundation in the geography of the study. You can see the overall zoning map for the town here. At the center of the square, of course, is the town center. The town center is delineated by two zones. Uh, the B1 and the B out, B1 out, so the business district and the business outer district. Um, and those are the dark brown and the lighter brown tones that you see here on the map. So that's really the focus, the study area that we're looking at, the parcels we're trying to understand very closely. Uh, and at this point, um, we may, it, as part of this study, it's from a planning perspective, silly not to look at some of the other adjacent parcels to see if they also have circumstances which would benefit from a change in the future. But we aren't going to make any sort of hard recommendations about zoning boundary changes because those can often become controversial. We might make recommendations about a future consideration of that. But I think here we're more focused on the characteristics of B1 and B1 out to try to get those changes completed in a non-controversial way. Um, the Here's a little bit better way to look at the, that area if you're more familiar with the aerial photograph and less familiar with the parcel map. 
um, really includes hopefully all the areas that you would consider a part of town center. Um, and you can see those outlined here on the map, you know, from Main Street and Liberty Lane and Meeting House Road, uh, all along there, basically around the commuter rail stop and up the hill, uh, both commuter rail parking lots. I'm not sure what its evolution was in terms of zoning, zoning district, but it's likely just a, a denotation that it's not the core of town center, that it's a little outer area of town center. So it would be, and it has, I think, zoning characteristics which also ref, uh, uh, go along with that notion where it's a, a little less intense development in the outer area. So that's the difference between B1 and a B1 out. And then uh, the, you can see here again the overall study area in a more three-dimensional aerial view uh, with the town center at its center with the roundabouts, federated church. Uh, it includes um, town hall, the Walgreens, up Liberty Lane, each of those uh, greenfield sites all along the way uh, and the properties down along the, the rail corridor as well. And there you can see the overall boundaries of the district. And we're also considering in, in light of the comments that we received in the survey and just thinking about some future improvements that could tie all this together in terms of bikeability, walkability, but not zoning changes. So don't get the wrong idea that we're not thinking about like taking anyone's residential neighborhood and making it different or anything like that. Um, but we are, are thinking about in terms of mostly connectivity uh, about that 10 minute walk or so, uh, about a half mile walking radius, which is the traditional catchment for a transit station that people, you might imagine someone might take a walk to get on the commuter rail line. Also a part of our study uh, is looking at um, a build out for our recommended zoning. So we have started to create a simple three-dimensional digital model of the town center with parcels and buildings and building footprints and impervious surfaces. And we'll be doing simple, what we call massing diagrams, which is just small, simple building footprints and masses of uh, testing our zoning recommendations when we get to that point. So we can have a better understanding of the amount of square feet that it might be producing uh, from a zoning change, the implications to stormwater, wastewater, uh, parking, uh, those types of considerations. And that's how we're gonna get at some of those uh, fiscal and financial or technical realities of redevelopment. Uh, some of the open space uh, highlights, uh, which are included in the ge geographic information systems, parcel data, uh, mostly the town common and the school system, the school fields, which are right outside of the cafeteria here, are the main assets close into town center. So in the town center, these are the parcels uh, which we are looking at very closely in this study in terms of all their current characteristics, ownership patterns, uh, development patterns, density, parking ratios, all of those characteristics, both today and under current zoning and under zoning recommendations. There are about 52 parcels which are fully within that B1 and B1 out, uh, almost 108 or over 108 acres. Uh, three or three parcels which are partially in and partially out of the B1 uh, and the uh, B1 out. And then there are 20 parcels which we've preliminarily identified as ones we might wanna look at be just because of their adjacency, but they may or may not have any recommendation associated with them in the future. And you can see those all, all there. We've, we've just slightly shifted this so that the it's not exactly north is up on this, just for orientation's sake, but the, it was easier to fit on a slide. And then there, this is a historic area, um, and along Rockwood Road, particularly uh, with the fe uh, Federated Church of Norfolk and um, other properties uh, in the town center, uh, in the, the small historic uh, building on the town common itself. Uh, so that's another consideration, particularly with the design guidelines and the characteristics of the town center that we want to see happen. 
So I just want to touch on uh, briefly some of our initial reactions to those two main uh, deliverables uh, specifically, zoning and um, design guidelines. So here's the zoning again with the digital model uh, associated with it. And we've looked through the zoning now um, a few times and, and thought through it uh, based upon where we're at in the study so far. And a few, a few things that we've identified that might be hindrances. Um, the first is that it currently requires a special permit. Um, there's not, a special permit requirement isn't necessarily the rolling the welcome mat out for development investment. Um, it, it can be, it, it is not often easy to get lending if you're under, if you don't actually have a project approved by right, um, but you need to have a special permit required to make that happen. Those, um, it's not guaranteed that you can actually get that project approved and therefore it's not guaranteed that you can get it uh, financially supported either. There are other items in the zoning which might not provide enough flexibility for development in terms of what you could do on a certain site or parcel. Uh, and I've listed those here. So the maximum story, the maximum height of three stories or 40 feet to the peak. Uh, in some circumstances, not all, in some circumstances it might not be tall enough. Uh, residential shall not have more than two bedrooms per unit. That's getting to be pretty detail, a pretty detailed constraint on how a developer is being able to put together their residential um, recipe. Um, and and my, my own opinion is that you wouldn't necessarily need to get into uh, how they're doing the bedrooms at a zoning level, maybe at the uh, later on in the approvals. Um, and then the, another limitation on units is a residential density limit, 16 units per lot. So you're saying that basically you can't have a project that's more than 16 units, which is a pretty big um, encumbrance. Uh, maximum lot coverage might be another uh, consideration, which might be low uh, at 60% today. And then there's a, there is a shared parking reduction. Uh, putting a, on the site all the parking that's required is sometimes a difficult um, relationship to resolve. Uh, and the shared parking reduction does help in making that work out. But the zoning today still forces the developer to reserve the area that would be required for all the parking. Even though they get a reduction, they still have to have all that area. So it's not really benefiting their ability to create a site plan that works. So these are some of the items here that we're, we're looking at in detail as initial uh, sort of flags that were raised for us. And I'm sure as we get into it more and more, um, there'll be others and refinements to that list uh, as this moves along. In terms of design guidelines uh, and analysis, so uh, we're thinking about each of the parcels and their frontages in the town center and how they're contributing to the character of the town center. Uh, and there are uh, some parcels, of course, which we've shown here in the darker blue, uh, which don't have a frontage, a building per se. They're a green uh, lot, so they're not really contributing to the character of town center. And those are really the shorter term targets uh, for the types of development, you, the locations where you'd wanna see development occur. Uh, there is development occurring where that little green is at the corner next to town hall, and that the building uh, I, I think to my eye looks fantastic and it's getting further and further along every time I visit. Uh, and then there's some longer term building frontages which are our contributors to the town center but could over time be thought about ways to improve their frontage, landscape, longer term redevelopment, et cetera. But those aren't probably the shorter term targets. Uh, it's the green fields really that are the shorter term targets. And of course then the elements which I've featured uh, in the diagrams, the meeting house, the common, the town hall, those are the fundamental components of what the town center is about. You can see here in the pictures, uh, all of the current design guideline uh, uh, information and foundation that's provided for us. Uh, things like pitched roofs, wood clapboard siding, uh, cupolas, gable ends, uh, historic windows, chimneys, dormers, each of those are elements that you see in the vocabulary of Town Center today. So we're trying to build that vocabulary up. And then stone walls, porches, awnings, gazebos, again, you see those today. And that's what we're trying to see more of. Yeah, so um, they're, they're similar in certain regards. So form-based zoning 
is actually an approach where uh, you're not necessarily concerned about the uses specifically, but creating the building envelope or the form that the uses would go in. And that's what design guidelines are also about, design guidelines and design standards. So I see design guidelines and design standards as a way to introduce more form-based elements into a standard zoning bylaw uh, without going through a lot of the, in some ways, extra effort that a form-based code requires. And, and it really moves towns and municipalities, form-based codes do, into many times uncharted territory and less familiar zoning, which makes it more difficult to create and to adopt. So I think that the approach that's being taken here is, is a well-worn approach, and it's typically a very successful one to bring more, more control over the form and character of architecture that occurs into a more traditional zoning bylaw. And then lastly, um, as I did mention, we will be touching on wastewater and stormwater mostly after we get through the exercise of determining a build out under the zoning recommendations for the, for the um, town center. And that will give us some capacity issue, capacity type numbers to then test against these two components. Yeah. I, I was thinking that perhaps you could chunk this up a level and instead of calling it these two specific ones, call it utilities, put these under there and also consider gas and perhaps hmm. other utilities such as uh, internet or whatever. Yeah. That's a good point. I, the point is here to broaden this beyond these two more specific items and step up a level in terms of utilities um, and maybe even utilities or just more generally impacts would be another way to think about it. Because as we get to a, num a presumptive number about our zoning recommendations may result in X square feet of development or X housing units, then we could think about in a sort of conceptual way what other types of impacts that number might come along with just beyond, in addition to these, these two items, which are also critical. So uh, the survey, that, that's kind of our, our more technical standpoint. And I, I will pause here again for questions. We've had some along the way. But this is uh, the uh, analytical side, the sort of planning and architect side of things that we're approaching the process from. Uh, but we also did, through the survey, I have some responses where everyone has gotten a chance to weigh in on these same topics. And I have uh, some interactive phone voting next, which is, I think, the fun part. But I'll pause here and see if there are any other clarifying questions from this part. Yeah. Uh, just trying to square the idea. Uh, you had an image of a circle, and this was a walkable distance, mm -hmm. or a typical walkable distance. Yeah. But to my eye, it seems like there's very few houses there. Whereas yeah. if, yeah, the number of respondents that are saying that they would walk were up in the 80s, mm -hmm. does that square I, I, I was a little surprised by the, sur the level of um, optimism for walking and biking on the survey response as well, just because of the situation you described where uh, the density of housing around in that half mile isn't that high. Um, but I, I think that uh, it might make sense. Uh, I haven't done the analysis of looking at specifically the streets people were mentioning uh, in their comments of the survey, but it might point to some of the, there are a few streets that have a, lot, a little higher density um, in the town center half mile. Um, but I think it does, the desire, I think is a, a pretty typical response that we're seeing across the region that people want to be able to walk or bike to amenity centers or transit centers. And they, they want really badly to just have an easy, safe way to do that. And so I think maybe that's what the survey responses are showing. So it might be even, what I'm imagining <coughs> is that it has to, that those positive responses have to also be occurring for people who are outside of that half mile because that was 500 responses or so, or I guess 300 who positively responded to that. So um, it might even be people who are a mile or so from the town center that would see a way if it were a mile route that was safe. Yes. I have not yet, but that, that could fall under these same considerations for utilities about capacity of water. It's <coughs> yeah. a great point. Josh, I don't want to do 
derail the conversation, but I'm wondering if you could touch on your experience with 40B projects and higher density housing development and um, how some of the zoning recommendations that we may get to would support that density in the center of town rather than out in the woods. Right. Um, so 40B, the questions about 40B, my experience with 40B, uh, and the, how this might relate to it. And I think that, so people that don't know, 40B is a state uh, law. Uh, it invites uh, developers and property owners to have the ability to develop affordable housing at a scale and density that is not typically allowed by the current municipality zoning and allows them to kind of uh, circumvent local rules so that they can produce housing, which is a state need, which is something our agency supports uh, in terms of the production of housing. Um, but also the 40B law um, does also circumvent some aspects of smart growth planning in that it allows very dense housing to occur in places which aren't close to services or aren't close to transit or walkable areas. Uh, so we think that processes like this are actually very beneficial in that they do allow the zoning to be tweaked so that we think it's a really successful recipe to invite higher density housing potentially where it is most beneficial to the community. And that would be where the amenities are, where the transit is, and where are the walkable areas. The flip side of that for a community like Norfolk is if you are uh, producing higher density housing in a place where it belongs and you can somehow through those processes maybe make some of those units affordable along the way, you could actually help get the community to that 10% threshold, at which point, and the 10% threshold is a state statute, mandatory, well not, man, yeah, it's mandatory, but um, it's up to you all to get to that threshold. So it's 10% of your overall housing stock as affordable units. And once you reach that threshold, you have more control and ability to say no to 40Bs when they come forward. Rich, do you know the current number? It's just under 5% right now. So, thank you, Rich. So, the, Norfolk is around 5% today on, on achieving that 10% goal, so about halfway there. Does, um, does, does the 40B also exempt uh, the design review guidelines? Yes, so if the design review guidelines we're creating here. Correct. Te technically, um, it's the local regulations of any kind, design guidelines, zoning, et cetera, that are able to be circumvented by the 40B process so that the developer effectively goes to the Zoning Board of Appeals and deals with them directly for project approval. Um, the state agencies which are involved in the process of approval for 40Bs do look favorably upon uh, municipal recommendations through that review process which are based upon currently in place rec currently in place regulations so if you have town center zoning and town center guidelines and have a 40b then come to town center which isn't uh, in line with either of those you would have very good standing as a town to say we want your housing but we want it to fit with these and then make those comments through the review process and DHCD or other reviewing agencies would look kindly upon those comments from the town and could enforce them. Um, the other potential in that whole recipe, I don't want to go too far down the 40B discussion, but there could also be potential for what is called a friendly 40B, where it is actually a location that the town would see as a good location for the type of project, and they might work with the developer in a more collaborative manner to make sure it aligns with the design guidelines and the zoning and all of that. Great. And the other, um, just to, the other intricacy of the 40B planning is, uh, and I'm sure some of you in the audience know this already, that 
if you have a project which is a 40B rental project, you, all of the units will become eligible for that 10% the 10% listing, the inventorying. If it's an ownership project, only the affordable units count towards that listing. So there is a benefit and there's an incentive built in uh, for rental housing units as a part of that, um, and an incentive for the town as well. Um, and just to close out that question, um, my personal experience uh, before coming to MAPC and working as a uh, principal planner here, I worked for a consultant planning uh, uh, firm and did 40Bs on the development side as part of that work. So have experience also from the site planning and architecture perspective for 40B projects around Massachusetts and, and have dealt with the, that approvals process from that perspective. Uh, so, so I'm very familiar with the intricacies of, of it all. Um, but I think that this, the short answer to all of that is that this actually I think is a beneficial project both for the town center and for overall residential and town planning in Norfolk and could potentially allow you to um, protect other parts of the town which are less well suited to this type of development and make sure it's located here. So I would love to get in the next section. So how would you help us shape these recommendations? And for this section, you can use, start on the back side of your agenda, or what we'd prefer you to do is get out your phone and, uh, and enjoy a little interaction here with us. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, I, I do have to say in a very sort of commercial-like way, standard text messaging rates will apply. <laughs> um, but if you text MAPC MTG to the number 22333, you should be able to join up with the system, the, the mothership cloud system that is running this survey. And then when I advance to the next few slides, you'll be able to respond on your phone and the, your answers will show up on the screen. It's actually really neat. But if you don't have that ability, please do uh, write down with a pen or pencil. We, we have pens by the door if you didn't grab a pen. Um, your answers on the sheet. All right, so let's, let's dive right in, see if this is working right. So the first question uh, echoes a little bit of what we were getting at in the online survey, but just a brief one or two word answer. We'd like you to answer, what is the most important aspect of Norfolk Town Center to get right? So what's the overall, the most important aspect that we need to get right in all of this. And if you, once some answers start showing up, if you respond with the a same answer, then that answer should get bigger as a word. So it's a word cloud. So the number of frequency of the answers should get. So getting the services right. So making sure it's friendly for visitors, and gathering areas, social, welcoming. So there's, a, there's some themes there, some welcoming, friendly, gathering, visiting. Get the planning right, hopefully that's what we're here for. Get the parking right, yeah. Oh, services is growing. I think the town has a great start on the services with the new town library and the town, town uh, hall. Getting the candy and chips right. And this is, this is uh, uncensored, by the way, so we're putting a lot of trust in you all with your cell phones right now. Getting the dining right. Getting the cell right. In the housing, businesses. So the big ones are services, evening, residential, beer. <laughs> Uh, and right, right. Welcoming is getting pretty big. Yeah, well, I think the, the businesses that probably operate in the evening may serve beer and might be available after some services would put together. That'd be a pretty good recipe for town center, it seems like. 
All right, so get your, get your last answers in on this one uh, because I am going to move off this slide. I'm always a little nervous about this because I'm not sure what the lag time is between how long you've put in your answers and how long it takes for them to come across. Okay, I'm going to move on. So answers are closed on this one. Thank you for that. And this, so by the way, this is all recorded, so we get to dig through this back at the office and see what kind of patterns show up. Uh, but one of the questions in the online survey was a little similar to this, and we asked, what is Town Center's greatest asset? Uh, and location and convenience was the number one, um, and that would be relative to residents because that was most of the respondents. Transit access was next, walkability and streetscape, and then there were a bunch of divergent answers for others, so there wasn't any clear pattern what the other was. But location and convenience right at the center of town, that makes sense. And then we also asked, what is the greatest challenge? And the greatest challenges were business and variety and businesses and quality. Now we have another question for you here this evening in the audience. What is the most important aspect of future development in Norfolk Town Center to get right? So this is narrowing it from the town center generally to specifically about that next building, that next site that's developed, future development. What does it need to get right? Or what's the most important aspect? the design and the architecture, the density, quality, again, restaurants and food being echoed. There's a consistency, a homogeneity, get the parking right, get the utilities right. Get the selling of it right. Livability, I think, is a good, good word. Get the zoning right. Hopefully, that's our focus in this. That, that's the part that we can control most. We can, some of the other parts we can't control as well. 40R, yeah, it's interesting. So we talked about 40 Bs, but we didn't talk about 40 R, which is a smart growth district, which invites affordable housing units in certain locations. Uh, and that could be something we explore. That comes along with incentive payments to the town for each unit produced. Culture, restaurants. So we've got architecture, definitely, I think, is the biggest word. Then parking, density, zoning, marketing, quality, design, and permitting. Great. All right, so I'm going to close this one down. All right, everybody good? Happy enough? And then we asked similarly in the survey, what types of development do you want to see in town center? And I think echoing some of the, the food and, and beer and uh, dining and evening, restaurants and retail businesses were the top two with personal services uh, shortly behind those. So really, um, the types of uses and businesses that make a town center buzz and that are vital uh, and that make it thrive. So those all fit pretty well together. Let me, all right, so next we're going to get into another question, but I've been holding on to your next handout if you're using the paper.
Oh, okay. That's fine. All right. So we didn't want you all to sit down and fill everything out at once, so we had to phase this a little bit. Um, so the next questions are about zoning and design guidelines. And if you've got your paper or your phone, you can keep going with the phone. Um, so the next is about uh, building height. So how tall should future buildings be in town center? One to two story, two to three story, three to four story, or four story or more? And you just text in the corresponding letter to the answer you want to see. Yeah, yep. So I think, yeah, there's, a, there's a, definitely a relationship between a building height that's allowed and density that's allowed and the viability of development. So uh, many communities that we have these types of conversations in, uh, there's a balance to be struck between what the community wants to see, which is often lower than what the market would want to produce, and what the developer would want to see, which is often higher than what the community wants to see or what, would the, or the, what they would ultimately want to allow. So there's definitely a balance and a sweet spot that we're always trying to find between what pushes the community's comfort level potentially, what create, which, which helps create viability from a financial redevelopment perspective, and then what the community will ultimately allow, uh, which will allow a development project through. In the circumstance of Norfolk, I will say that um, the greenfield parcels are a different circumstance than normally is considered in these circumstances. And that you are, uh, in the height and density equation, you're always having to build much more because you're usually replacing something. So you're having to build up more density and height to replace an existing building and get it out of the way. Um, we might have a little more flexibility here, but I, I'm, I, and say that very cautiously because I don't want anyone's expectations to really get too high about the scale. But it also looks like there's not as much preference for one and two story. Um, just from a sheer, my own perspective, from a town center character and urban design perspective is, is that one and two story structures often don't give enough um, framing of a street environment or of a uh, town center to make it feel like the type of place you want it to be. It's usually at least two stories or sometimes three stories um, or more. And there are interesting things that you can do in terms of three story plus buildings that are maybe having a half floor tucked in the peak of a roof so that the developer can get a little more square footage that don't look as um, giant in a community like this as maybe a four or taller building would. So there are, there are some tricks in terms of architectural treatments and features to do. But in this case, there might be pretty great alignment with what you all, at least in this room, might want to see and what the market might want to produce, which would probably be a sweet spot of in the neighborhood of three to four stories. But this is something we're going to be looking at really closely. So it looks like everyone's got their answer in. This question we did actually ask very specifically in the survey as well. So we have a lot of responses to, to build upon. But this is uh, goes along, diagrams which go along with the verbal um, narrative I was just offering, where uh, there is a certain both uh, urban design definition that's created by the height of the building in relation to the street and its frontage, uh, and a scale of building which comes along with the stories, of course. Uh, and that, I would say, two to four range in a context like Norfolk Center is probably what people are going to be aiming at. Uh, in other contexts, it's very different, of course. The closer you get to the inner core of the Boston communities, uh, they uh, would be four plus, of course, is something that everyone's trying to hit in some of the neighborhood contexts. And then I've touched on this too, but related to this is density. Uh, and again, these are uh, Height is a part of that equation for density, and then lot coverage and the scale of it on the lot is the other part. 
And I ask this question as much to give an opportunity to explain a little bit about density as I do to get your thoughts about it. Because sometimes it's hard to tell actually what, how dense a building is. But would you want a building that's half as big as the property, as big as the property, one and a half times as big or two times as big, or even bigger? So, bigger, are you talking about just like the, from the floor? Like, like a floor? So I, um, density is how much area is on a site, okay? Or how many units, units or area. It can be measured a few ways. So one of the, I guess I tried to put this in more layman's terms, but probably failed. Because um, the more technical way to describe this is floor area ratio. Uh, and the floor area ratio is a measure of how much building area there is divided by how much site area there is. So if you have a 10,000 square foot lot and a 5,000 square foot building, you'd have a FAR of 0.5. So your building is half as big as your lot. So that's a, that's a measurement of uh, architecture and planning. And clearly it also depends on the number of stores. Correct. So you can, the right, they work together. Um, but you could have a, on a big site, you could have a, property which has a 0.5 FAR, which is three stories tall. And so there's, it's not exactly a, you know, a perfectly linear relationship, uh, but there is some differentiation that could occur. I would say, um, the, the, I think the density is a tricky thing because there are certain studies of FAR uh, where, where height is definitely the, the dimensional characteristic that you can feel and see and understand very clearly from the street. But density, you might not be able to look at a building on the street and say, oh, that's, that's a 0.76 FAR for sure, because you don't know how deep the building is, you don't know uh, what's going on up in its roof or et cetera. So I think it's a tricky number, but it does help in terms of us understanding what the character of the town center is and how much flexibility you can have with those density numbers. So it looks like everyone's got this in. Sorry if it's a, a little tricky question, but the, um, a part of the point was that this is, a, this is a characteristic that we're looking at, and it's a characteristic we're probably gonna have recommendations around, and it's a way for us to start the conversation so that you all, and we can share what we think about density, but it's also just to have density be an idea that's out there that we're, we're thinking about and communicating. And, and the, I mentioned also floor area ratio, which is another term you might see come along, which I'm not sure is used in the zoning today. I don't know if it is. So here is a, the same visual description with that measurement, uh, which I mentioned, the FAR, which is floor area ratio. And so you see that the one story building, so these are all the same footprint of building. So the one story building is covering it has half as much building area as it does site area in that diagram. A two-story building is a little less than, or a little more than double, I guess. So you are double the previous diagram. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna make it even more confusing if I try to explain it that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that diagram has 1.22 times building area as it does site area, as compared to site area. So then this two, or I guess three-ish story building has um, 1.88, so that much more building area than site area. And then the last one here, which is a four-story structure, is about two and a half times the amount of building area as it has its site below it. And that's just by the stacking of the floors, of course, and the area on each floor. So these are numbers which um, we'll be measuring in terms of the context of the town center, and that will tell us how much stuff is a good fit. And as I mentioned, you can also measure density in a number of ways. So you can measure, that's a square footage measurement I was just talking about, which is expressed as that ratio. Um, and then you could also measure units per acre, which is also very difficult to tell, and which is one of the um, limitations which is in zoning today, which is the 16 units per acre. And I, I, I would challenge any of us to go out to a project and say, yes, that is 16 units per acre. It's, it's very impossible to do. Mostly because 
unit size factors into that pretty heavily. So it could be really dense because the units are 500 square feet downtown, or it could be that the units are, it's not that dense because the units are 2,000 square feet apiece. Um, but you can see here, if you just take a 1,000 square foot unit and apply it to those square feet that I'd calculated before, and, and call the ground floor commercial. So these are all assumed to be mixed use. So your upper level on the first one and the upper left, zero units because you don't have an upper level. The second one, you get about seven units if you have a thousand square foot units. Third one, 14 units on those two floors. And the fifth one, or the fourth one, 21 units. And they don't, they don't necessarily have to go up in a linear fashion like that. Um, and it would depend a lot on how the architectural layouts are working out and everything else, unit size, as I mentioned, the efficiency of the layout in terms of hallways and things like that, how many, how many exercise rooms there are, that sort of thing. So it's a tough measure. It's a tough measurement is the take home message there. So we asked what would be a good fit uh, as part of the survey. And I guess similar to you all, maybe a little more conservative, the majority from the online survey were falling into the two to three story, if not smaller range, 93% of responses, with just a few up in the three to four story range. And here in the meeting this evening, you were more focused on the three to four story range. And, that, and once we kind of get a feel for some of those sites and how they might build out, uh, the three and four story range might be the more appropriate, but we don't, we don't know that answer yet. And then last, lastly, we wanted to talk a little bit about your opinions on design components. So we, I like to break these down into some distinct uh, segments of design components. And I would be interested in what you think the priority should be for Norfolk Center. Uh, site frontage is the area between the building and the road right of way. It includes sidewalks, uh, plazas, seating areas, the curb cuts, Street trees often, uh, furniture, street furniture, uh, curbs, on-street parking potentially, other landscape features. So there's a whole world of design guidelines about how that space should be assembled and what it should feel like. As opposed to the rest of the site design, which is how the parking is laid out, uh, how the building is oriented, what the relationship between the parking and the building is, which is in front of the other, uh, how circulation works, how pedestrian access and bike access works, uh, the setbacks, the landscape buffers to adjacent properties. As opposed to the building design itself, uh, which is integrating itself into the district, uh, how it relates and reacts to other neighboring buildings, uh, reducing the height or bulk, if that's uh, something we'd want to look at defining streets and open spaces with that uh, sense of enclosure, activating the ground floor through uses or transparency through glass, uh, or balancing privacy um, and activity versus really focusing on the facade of the building, the elevation or the front or sides, whichever are the most visible. And that relates to the character, the materials, uh, organizing multiple tenants or users, balance, proportion, the details, and we can also uh, get into the guidance around those elements. And then lastly, sort of the, the, the tack on elements, we have uh, landscape, which could be integral to both site and frontage, so that's, that's kind of integrated through, through some of the others, uh, but it could also mean specific items or, or approaches to street trees, or uh, strips of landscape on the edges of properties. Uh, it could also be about screening utilities or other objects, uh, and then site signage and building signage, how those relate to each other, coordination amongst tenants, enhancing the look and feel. So among those, do you think there's one that should be the focus for Norfolk Town Center? We're gonna be putting together all of this information should, is there one part of that information that should be more prominent than the others? And not to say that we would ignore others, but we can, we could, if there's a clear priority, we can definitely 
put a focus into the guidelines, um, but we will probably touch on information within each of these areas. All right, looks like building design followed by site frontage, which also has a very strong relationship to building design. So that's very helpful guidance. And I think appropriate to where, where this needs to be headed for the center's benefit. Okay, everyone got their answers in? So we will um, think about that as we're moving into specific recommendations. We did have I just noticed the time, so I'm going to try to move a little faster. I've been apparently a little long-winded. And um, so we, are, uh, we asked in the overall survey, what's the most appropriate approach to architectural style? I thought it was very telling. Match what we already have was sort of the biggest response. Or give us a more traditional version of what we already have, which I think is also a very clear direction. And those were 72% of those responses, as opposed to a less traditional version of what we have a more modern version of what we have or something completely different. And again, we're trying to, I don't know how successful we are, but we're trying to make these more accessible layman terms and phrases as opposed to speaking like architects and planners all the time. Um, and then we asked people, what are the features that they'd want to see as part of town-centered designs in buildings? Street trees and generous landscaping, pitched building roofs, dormers, bay windows, frequent generous windows, parking lots screened by landscaping, entry porches, landscape features, those were all top hits with, with quite a bit of resounding support. You can see the numbers, those are responses there. So this is, for us, this is gold in terms of setting, putting together a set of guidelines because you've given us very specific direction about where to focus. And then even materials, we asked about what, what types of materials would you prioritize? And people could choose as many of these answers as they, would, they, they wanted, by the way. So wood siding or decking or cladding, uh, stone, brick, glass, composite wood, natural materials really at the top. And then as you got into uh, less natural materials, vinyl, uh, plastic, et cetera, those kind of fell, fell down in popularity. All right, this is the last section, hopefully the quickest and most fun, but we do have a few to click through here. So this, is, this also helps us it's a design preference. Um, you basically, we're asking you within a certain category, like site frontages, to respond to these images, whether or not you like it. You like it a lot, it gets a green thumb. You like it okay, a white thumb. You are neutral or indifferent, you give it a question mark. You don't like it a little, you give it a, a thumbs down. And you don't like it a lot, you give it a red thumbs down. And you can either mark it on your sheet or do it with the votes. So you get A, B, C, D, and E. And so you're thinking about this as, what if, a, what if a project came forward and this was the condition of the site frontage, the sidewalk that they gave you with the storefronts, the street trees, the signs? Are you like, all right, we're heading in the right direction? Or are you saying, no, thank you? And hopefully we'll find through this, uh, there's 15 images here, so I'm going to move right along. But the, Num the images, hopefully you will select some and share with us that there are some well-liked images that then we can use in the design guidelines themselves, but also dissect and understand what are the good parts of that image. Okay, so almost a you know, little bit of thumbs up on that one. So here's the next one, another site frontage. This is more focused on uh, some curb ball bouts, benches, landscape features. You can see how the uh, there might be some stormwater benefits, some, maybe that's a bit of a swale or rain garden effect or approach that gets incorporated with the small shrubs there. So is this something you'd want to see more of? If a developer brought it forward, is this something we want people to do more of? All right, looks pretty well supported. Moving right along. And here's another one. It's got maybe a little more going on. Some benches, landscaping, a little center island landscaping, the store frontage with the awnings. Looks a little more maybe dense with activity. There's on-street parking. 
some two, two tones to the sidewalks. <laughs> Just that these are, I wouldn't necessarily call these types of surveys scientific, but it's kind of your initial reaction to the image. There's a, there is a lot going on in the pictures to, to judge. All right, looks like that one settled out as indifferent. So here's another, which has a generous landscape grass strip to the street. Also some uh, stone walls enclosing an outdoor seating area. Has a nice street banner on the street light. All right. Uh oh. Yeah, we might have just broke our presentation. That's why it's always good to have a backup. So I guess we'll do this a little quicker because we're definitely stuck. I apologize, but if you could switch to your paper, if you have your paper copy in front of you, and complete the rest, and I will just guide you through it. So there was one more in site frontage, and it was, uh, it has landscape, a pretty strong landscape edge along the street with street trees. Um, and then there's, we move into a category of building design and starting with a few of the images that were from Wayland Town Center. Uh, those are one and two story structures, have a traditional look to them, could be restaurants, could have some housing above, but the building design itself, how do you react to that? Is it good or bad? Then on the first page, the bottom right corner is uh, an image from Pine Hills in Plymouth which has a very nice New England look to it, I think. I'd be interested to see what you think. And then on the, if you flip to the back side of that page, there are two more images in building design. One is from the Kingstown project with a, a gray uh, facade and siding, about three stories, two and a half stories. And then another project is um, from outside of New England, heaven forbid down in Virginia, um, and that's, that's a more, uh, it's set up in a series of distinct bays where they have a bay with brick and a bay with uh, wood and a bay with porches. So is that a look that you'd like or not so much? And then the last five are more about uh, the contributions of landscape and signs, and they relate to outdoor seating environments and the ability just to put up some signage and some umbrellas uh, as has been done in Duxbury, or an, a more <coughs> developed exterior space as, as is in Wayland Town Center next to that, or even a more lush sort of approach where you think about green walls and vegetation on the sides of buildings, which could be something that we try to encourage through design guidelines. And then the image with the parking lot is supposed to be a parking lot which is a little more uh, green and has some landscape shrubbery and some trees in it. And then I think the last image in that landscape section is a, is a very robust approach to uh, landscape on a site, which is more in a park environment than on a site, but it could be this type of approach. We have um, pretty intensive paving uh, suggestions um, or other landscape features or stone walls, that sort of thing. So I apologize for our presentation. We were just too technologically advanced for our own good. Um, but please do finish up the survey on the paper. We're just about at 8.30 and our time is up. So I will say that from here forward, our next steps uh, include wrapping up the survey, so please participate in that if you haven't. Uh, we'll be meeting with the 
uh, working committee over the next couple months, few months uh, through June, and those meetings will be uh, advertised and are open to the public. So if you're interested in staying a part of the process, please do join us for those. Uh, just a strategy question. So yeah. when you're done, you have recommendations, uh, and you implement those recommendations. How do, how do things change? Is it a, you know, is the strategy, if we change it, they will build, you know, kind of like a field of dreams thing, or do you get the word out somehow? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a few approaches to that. Uh, obviously, one of the approaches is uh, communicating with the owners, the property owners, and letting them know that these changes have occurred. Uh, we're working with Rich and going to try to get in touch with some of the owners through this process. Um, but then also, I think you can do, there are certain approaches where you can invite sort of area developers to Norfolk Center and let them see what has been happening, let them understand what your current zoning looks like after some of these recommendations have been uh, taken through. And uh, that's had quite a bit of success in other communities where they actually do, like they call it a developer's round table or some tour or something like that. Uh, so that's one approach, or you can um, you know, kind of work behind the scenes too. And if there's a developer who did Wayland Town Center or some other place that you like, then invite them to come talk or look at Norfolk Center. Uh, but I think a part of that is getting, getting the zoning right. And there's also a strategy around that too. So we will, from this study, provide very concrete recommendations. But then, of course, those recommendations will have to be seen through and adopted and approved, which will involve clearly communicating, which I think hopefully tonight was a start of that, uh, communicating the reasons for doing it and the justification for it. And we'll be building that up through our reports as well. Other questions before we conclude this evening? Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we hope to talk to you some more if you have other questions. Thank you.